Welcome to the Creative Act. I'm Franz Geierhaus. The purpose of these programs is to introduce you to some of the conscious aspects of artistic creativity. We will watch artists in their studios at work and have them explain to us some of the ingredients of their creative processes. Much has been said and done about the mysterious aspects of creativity. Some writers emphasize unconscious determinants of the creative process. We will emphasize conscious events and happenstances. And we will accompany the artists on their path to realization. They will share with us some pivotal events in their childhood and adolescence. Influences by teachers, parents, who encourage them early on to go on drawing to make paintings. Each of our artists has been working at his art for decades and developed consummate skills. They have become superb draftsmen and with this technical skill at hand, they went about creating their works of art, carefully planning, consciously executing each of them. Each artist told us how important foreign travel was for him. It helped him free himself from cliches of his home culture. Today, we visit Werner Dravis, the German-born American artist who lives in Reston, Virginia. He was born in the last year of the 19th century near Berlin. Our visit with him actually begins in a Washington museum, where we came to observe a major exhibition of his graphic works. We are at the National Museum of American Art in Washington, D.C., and I'm standing at the entrance of an exhibition entitled Werner Dravis, 65 Years of Printmaking. One of the things that many artists did, and Dravis joined them, was to make a series of self-portraits, chronicling his own growth and maturation. And behind me is a selection of these. The one on the upper left was done in 1932 and is a woodblock print as are the others. The second one was done in 1947 and uh, was done with two plates. Below it is a self-portrait from the year 1959. And finally, the lower left, we have a self-portrait dating to 1971. I was born a long time ago before I can really remember. I know. Yes, and uh, I was born in a little village in the southeastern part of Germany where Silesia and Poland and Brandenburg come together. It's Polish now. Mm -hmm. My father was the reverend there of the Lutheran Church. I had a very nice childhood. When I was seven, we moved uh, farther west to a village between Potsdam and Brandenburg. And soon I had to be sent to a Latin school in Brandenburg. But uh, soon I found a group of friends. Uh, they called themselves the Wandervogel, which was a youth movement in those days. The boys and girls came together frequently for hikes. And what were your favorite subjects in school? My favorite subjects were gymnastics and drawing. I understand uh, that but you also, had a gymnastics teacher who was quite a good artist. Yes, I didn't know this. My gymnastics teacher was quite a famous artist, uh, one of the modern artists. My uh, drawing teacher was very good too, but very academic. Mm -hmm. But uh, since I loved drawing, he singled me out and he even gave me my first color books, oil color books, and came along with art on hikes. And we, when we hiked, we usually had a sketchbook along in our knapsacks and rendered landscapes. I At the age of 17, Dravis volunteered for the Imperial German Army and saw service in France. At the end of the war, he began studying architecture in Berlin. There was a very modern gallery, the Sturm, uh, run by Herbert Walden, quite a famous gallerist. 
and uh, he exhibited as one of the first ones men like Clay, Kandinsky, Mark, and so on, and the steel group, and the uh, constructivists from Russia. And there I saw one painting by William Vauer, which fascinated me. It was a very expressionistic painting of reds and yellows, and to me it uh, really realized what I had gone through the during the war in the trenches, and I had to possess it. So I finally bought it and borrowed the money from a rich aunt. Dreyfus soon realized that he was more drawn to interior design and fine arts than architecture. In 1921, he applied to the Bauhaus in Weimar. So I submitted some work to Gropius and was sub admitted. Some of our professors, um, most of them were, were very important artists by themselves already, like Clay and Itten and Kandinsky. But you did leave the Bauhaus, and partially because you did not get everything you had hoped for, such as uh, yes. painting classes. Uh, the arrangement was in those days one had to uh, make four years of an apprenticeship in one craft. And I also wanted to paint, to learn to paint. And none of our uh, artist painters uh, had a class in painting. And I had also the urge to look behind the fence of Germany to see something of the larger world. Dreyfus first went to Venice, where he copied some of the paintings of Tintoretto. His interest then shifted to Velasquez and El Greco. He wanted to go to Spain anyway, since his German girlfriend could come there from the Azores where she worked. They were married in Madrid, and later traveled to South America and the United States, where they spent a year, mostly in St. Louis and San Francisco. In 1927, Dreyfus returned to Germany via Japan and the Soviet Union. Since I felt fairly lost in Germany at that time. I went back to the Bauhaus and Gropius admitted me now as a regular Bauhaus mm. man. Did you get any painting lessons uh, well, then during the second stage? At that stay? time, I banded together with a few other students and we persuaded Kandinsky to persuade Gropius to allow him to have some students in painting, which was quite interesting. Dreyfus left the Bauhaus in 1928 and moved to Frankfurt, where he had his first major exhibitions at the prestigious gallery Flechtheim. Observing with anxiety the ominous rise of Nazism, he emigrated to the United States in 1930 and settled in New York City. It was the depth of the Great Depression and made the beginning in America very difficult for the immigrant. In the early years, he made a series of woodcuts with New York skyscrapers as their theme. This was a first in art history. In 1936, Dravis and some other young artists banded together and founded the American Abstract Artist Group. During those years, Dravis also taught at various colleges and universities and worked for the WPA. At the end of World War II, he briefly joined Maholi Nash at his Institute of Design in Chicago before accepting a position at Washington University in St. Louis, where he remained for 18 years. Dravis is now retired and lives and works in Reston, Virginia, where we are visiting him today. When we arrived at his studio, he was printing one of his color woodcuts. There is a red under the gray, which I am going to print now, and then later the black. So it takes so long. That's all right. How many blocks do you have for this particular print? For this particular print, only two. And matter of fact, one block up at both sides. And what kind of paper do you use for your woodcuts? It's a Japanese paper called Ocho. Very soft paper.
Nun, das ist ein Piece of Hardwood, wo man Orange Tree, with which I press it down and rub it in the Japanese manner. You never use a press for your wood blocks? No. And of the over 400 wood woodblock uh, prints that you have made, you have printed them all by hand, by yourself? Yes. And most of your additions are how large? Oh, about 30, I would say. Mm -hmm. I have printed a few editions of a few hundred, but mostly they are 30, or some even less, 20. And do you uh, use the same colors each time within an edition? What? Do you use the same colors each time? No, the color varies sometimes because in the more complicated prints I can do only about six a day and then I have to remix the color the next time. It varies a little bit. This makes it more interesting too, I think. Yes. Or I try even out different combinations. Now for registration, I have some little marks here, some little holes, which I, if I insert later some nails, which is my own method of registration. Although you have done a lot of etchings and some lithographs, your preferred uh, print medium seems to be the woodcut. Yes. Uh, could you tell us uh, why? Because I don't have to go out of the house. The etchings, I have to use a printing press to, to print. And I have this in Loudoun College, which I have college, which is about 20 minutes drive away. This is one reason. But I also like wood and work with wood. It's the cheapest material. I prefer red wood now. Where do you find your wood? In the lumber yard. Mm -hmm. You're now inking the same side with gray, right? Mm-hmm, right. And uh, this will be superimposed exactly on the red? Yes. So you're actually making a three-color woodcut with two plates. Right. I hope it comes out. What does this gray do to the red? Does it cover it up completely? No, or? no. It, the red shines through a little bit. As you can see, this gives it a interesting color. Now I insert those little nails. I find this very fascinating to see how you do the registration. Yeah, it's uh, paper is a little wide for doing it. Uh -huh. Now, see, you have the gray mm -hmm. where the red shines through. Do you let to have these uh, dry now before you can apply the black, or you can go no, right No, I print wet and wet. Now comes the black. Davis had cut the image to be printed in black on the back of the same wood block he had used for the red and the gray. Well. Print now. Beautiful. 
Mm. It's amazing how all these colors now look different uh, when they're together than when they, you look yeah. at them separately. The gray could be a little dark, I guess. I remember with great pleasure in 1969 when we went to Guatemala together at Christmas time, and one of the most beautiful spots we both agreed on was yeah. Lake Atitlan with its two mighty volcanoes across the lake from the hotel where we stayed. And one afternoon, I accompanied you to the uh, border of the lake and watched you sketch. And I think this is where the woodcut mm. really mm -hmm. comes from, where we have the, um, the two volcanoes mm -hmm. here, but also in the first one, here are the palm trees. Mm -hmm. And I think this was the shed uh, by the hotel. Yes, well, my woodcuts later are composites of sketches. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, nobody believes this color, but this is really how rich it was. I remember the sunsets. That's what you think. Yes, that's, <laughs> well, I mean, it's a wonderful memory. Yes, yeah, it becomes alive. It becomes more the nature than it was. Yes, and that's what art is. Yes. Dravis told us that he has painted over 1,500 canvases. He usually begins with a pencil drawing and then develops a color sketch. When I have a color solution which I like, I do it in large. I try to get the edges fairly even, but not entirely sharp. And sometimes I need one color more than other. When you uh, translate uh, the, your image and the colors from your small scale sketch to the large canvas, uh, do alterations happen in the process? Of course. In terms of both shape and color? Yes, of course. And later I often use, instead of the brush, the palette knife to smoothen up the color area. Uh, this is a rather meticulous arrangement of meticulous shapes. Then again, sometimes I get the longing to be more spontaneous at the same time, and we can go over to the other painting now. now this means that you're working on several canvases at the same time. Yes. Oh, that's almost finished. But let's see, where's the sketch? I had here, for this idea, I had at first one sketch like this, which seemed to me a little boring and empty. And then I got the idea to fill part of it with uh, more or less accidental color happenings. And I came to form a title gradually, which I call now uh, Planetary Clash, as if two large uh, bodies come together suddenly. But this shows the contrast, let's say, of a uh, nature clash against civilization. Civilization, to my mind, is organization. And uh, I think that's one reason I recently have so many subjects with uh, slowly carried out semi-geometric constructions to show that discipline is really something we need more than uh, expressionism, while many of my contemporaries uh, dive into neo-expressionism. I don't like it too much. I mean, expressionism to me uh, had a great deal of did make sense right after the war, after the First World War, and even after the Second World War. But I think then one should realize that our civilization can go on only if we have organization and scientific research and all this is more exact 
Control, and discipline. I controlled, think. yes, and that's why I think uh, expression of using geometric formation has still a possibility. Of course, it was used in earlier days to the Russian constructivists during the revolution and right after the Russian revolution uh, had it and at the Bauhaus we were fond of it and Mondrian and the style group too. How do you know when a painting is finished? That's very hard to say. Sometimes I, it takes me weeks. Sometimes I come back after months and work again on it or after years even. I rework my paintings often later on. But I usually sit down there a little while and I can't stand on my feet too long anyway and think about it. And if it pleases me, I leave it. I have no great philosophy in my art, as many others of my colleagues. And I think the greatest impetus for me is just to play and to build and to create something. Creation is nothing else but play. And it's a self-satisfaction in a way. You build something and you are pleased when it works or you are unhappy if it does not work. Since I like color, I do it with color. If others also like it so much better, mm -hmm. I'm happy. If I can sell it to others, I'm still happier. That's all. Wonderful. But uh, in my uh, themes, so to speak, or in the origin which start me to build something, uh, I have entirely and different origins. I can be starting out with something visual which I see in nature. It could be a, a landscape, it could be a person, or it could be a spot on the wall, as Leonardo famously had said. But on the other hand, you can form also a cerebrally a theme, as Kandinsky taught us, to use an idea of organization. Uh, let's say you want to make a painting where the inner part of the painting is very dense and the surrounding more open, or where there is a concentration to one side or the other in form, and this might be juxtaposed with a color concentration or color I intensity. You can uh, limit yourself in color to cool colors or warm colors, to dark colors or light colors, and so on. You have innumerable uh, themes, uh, which are cerebral themes, mental themes, which you can follow up, and you can create a universe this way. Then another uh, origin could be a, a playful accident that you take some bits of color or black white horse and throw them on your lap and figure out what can this lead to. This is a way the Dada is formed the compositions very frequently. So there are several different ways and means you can begin a painting. And I could not say each time really which way is the first one. In my recent work, where I use more semi-geometric forms, I often start with very quick sketches which later develop by redoing it into definite themes which I work out gradually into color themes and mm -hmm. into paintings. And while I'm in the process of painting, I may find a theme which I uh, 
enhance later. Or you could also go out from a visual impact, as I said, or a mental state of mind that you feel depressed and want to overcome the depression or show your depression or your joy and uh, the heat, the seasons, of course, influence you. Uh, your well-being or not well-being influence you. All those are different forms of origin. But uh, may I maybe conclude this uh, visit with you by saying I get the wonderful feeling when I look at your work that you are deep down inside yourself a wonderful optimist because most I'm basically of, an optimist. Most yes, of your also works. They warn us now that there comes a big cataclysm which I cannot believe in. I think mankind muddled so long through centuries and it will go on for a while. Throughout his long life, Werner Dravis opened up literally to the world in his travels. He absorbed what he saw and distilled it in his work. Now mainly preoccupied with abstractions, he has a history of many realistic images both in landscapes and portraits. Color and form interact forcefully. He mentions playfulness as an important ingredient towards realization. I would like to say his love affair with life vibrates in his images and we vibrate with them. Thank you for joining us on this first out of nine programs on the Creative Act. I'm Franz Geilhaus. <laughs>